Good morning, friends. It's Sandra Clay. I'm the pastor at Cook's United Methodist Church. Welcome to our patio. Welcome to a gorgeous morning. I trust that it's already uh, met you, greeted you with joy and with um, glory for the day that is ahead. God has given us this as a trust. And what a way to start it with each other. Good morning, Ruth. Hey, Dwana. Um, and so um, uh, we're going to be in Jeremiah today. Uh, just remember, Jeremiah and Ezekiel um, were contemporaries with one another. Uh, Jeremiah... Um, starting his ministry as a young person and has endured a lot and I really want to focus today on um, a pivotal event uh, close to the end of his ministry and right before um, uh, Jerusalem is sacked. Hey Julie, how are you today? It is a happy Thursday. Um, and so a quick reminder before we jump into all of that, uh, quick reminders for, uh, getting involved. Hey, Charlene, how are you? Um, it, when we jump into ministry here in the immediate area for us in Wilson County, just remember, uh, salt ministry serving at the Lord's table is a food ministry, uh, for seniors who are underserved. Uh, if you, uh, we're, we collect boxes to deliver food in. We also collect uh, the food. Uh, no more green beans. We have enough green beans, maybe until Jesus comes back. Uh, but we've got other things. So, uh, hey, Jean, how are you? Good morning to you. Um, anyway, we've got salt going on. We've got uh, ministries uh, with the West Elementary uh, going on. Uh, we're getting ready for a habitat build in October. Uh, there's tons and tons of stuff. So uh, just check out the website if you get a chance to do that and uh, that all the information uh, is there even if you're just getting ideas for where you are in your community. Also want to remind you that we're, uh, we're diligent about praying for one another. Uh, and uh, Miss Jean, who just popped on a second ago, uh, Miss Jean's got some upcoming surgery. And so we're praying for courage and strength, for wisdom, for healing, especially. Uh, and so I know you want to join in uh, with that as well and offer your words of encouragement. So here we go. Uh, uh, well, there's no way around it, y'all. Uh, these two chapters, 37 and 38, in the book of Jeremiah, find Jeremiah in prison for nothing, and then it gets worse. So here's my question. Before we unpack the story, I mean, how these events unfold, and then I want to come back and us be courageous enough as though who, those who have heard God's call on our life to submit ourselves to the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus. Claim him as our master, our savior, but also commit to follow him that literally may lead us to some very difficult moments. Now we know it gives us courage, power, strength, um, uh, agency to get through difficult moments that life may bring us. But what do we do? Here's the question. What do we make of it when our obedience leads us to cells or cisterns. Um, if you've not read these two chapters uh, or heard this part of Jeremiah's story, you'll get it 
uh, soon enough. So, we, so, so let's go. Okay, so um, Jehoiachin uh, is the king of Judah, last one uh, in the line of David. Except now, King Nebuchadnezzar, who is marauding his way through Judah, is as close as their own breath to taking Jerusalem. He puts King Zedekiah, who is an uncle, so still in the line of David, but is an uncle to Jehoiachin, puts him in place, and he's more like a puppet king. He's going to do whatever saves his behind and the behind of his family and his court. That's just the way it is here. And because Nebuchadnezzar is breathing down the necks of those in Jerusalem, Zedekiah sends the priest Zephaniah to Jeremiah. Is that not confusing enough? So the priest goes on behest of the king to the prophet and says, would you pray to God for us? The point in that prayer, the, the motivation was that, you know, God did some pretty amazing things for our ancestors. And maybe if we ask specifically, God will do the same thing. The Babylonians will turn tail and run. The Egyptians will turn tail and run. And we'll be whew, okay. Well, Jeremiah had plenty of words, and they were words from God, but it was not what the officials of the king wanted to hear. Uh, it was not what uh, the king wanted to hear. And because it was not good news, and not the news that they wanted, when Jeremiah hears about the uh, closeness uh, or the movement rather of the Babylonian army and the Egyptian army, then he was going to hightail it with hope out of town. See, here's what's happening is the Babylonians are coming in from the east and maybe a little bit north and now to Judah uh, to take over. And they hear that the Egyptian army is closer than they are. So the Egyptians turn tail. The Babylonians tuck tail. Jeremiah is taking advantage of this moment of peace with nobody threatening to uh, take down Jerusalem just yet. And he's headed back to his hometown, the, uh, the town where Benjamin, uh, the tribe of Benjamin would have been that area. He's headed out the Benjamin gate, headed towards the homeland, so to speak, and is arrested. He's put into a cell that uh, was in the secretary's house but I want you to picture dungeon, um, like basement to the basement, uh, and an elevated or vaulted ceiling, so no windows, dank, uh, dirty. Uh, he goes from that kind of cell, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. So now he's kept in prison. The King Zedekiah calls for him. So he's taken out of prison and now is before the king, King Zedekiah, at the palace. And the king literally says to him, you got any word from God for us? As if it's going to change. I, there have been times when the word shifted a bit. But it's not going to change because God has been saying not just for days or weeks, but for months and for years, Israel, turn, turn to me. Israel, come on, this is what's going to happen. Jeremiah is not the first prophet who has said on behalf of God. 
what is coming. But Jeremiah, in his boldness, says, Yes, you're going to be carted off to Babylonia in exile. Jehoiachin was treated that way. Why is it a surprise to Zedekiah? But he allows all that's going to happen to just simply happen. Jeremiah is brought to this place. Any word from God? Yeah, you're going to be handed over. And so he goes to prison. Still, Jeremiah asks King Zedekiah, what crime have I committed? What, what crime have I committed? If you send me back there, I will die. He doesn't, uh, Zedekiah doesn't send him back to the cell. He's imprisoned rather in the courtyard of the guard. He's allowed to eat uh, scraps from the bakers along the street there. But he's still imprisoned. He's still hungry. Uh, he's still being judged. Uh, he's still being mistreated. All because he spoke God's truth. I, I just want to ask the question again, my friends. What happens when our obedience is connected to that cell or cistern experience? Oh, it's still getting worse. It's still unfolding. Listen to this. Zedekiah's officials uh, go to Jeremiah and give him another shot at saying something different. And the truth does not change. Those officials take him to an old cistern at the corner of the guard courtyard and down into an old cistern that is, the bottom is covered with mud and Jeremiah sinks down. There's only one official who goes to the king and talks about the wickedness of the other folks in power uh, and their decision to treat Jeremiah this way. The ki king Zedekiah gives this one official, Ebed Melech, he gives him permission to take 30 men with ropes and pulleys to get Jeremiah out of the cistern so that he does not die. King Zedekiah still seeks a private conversation with Jeremiah at the temple trying to figure out how to get himself out of this mess. And so the one he decided already was not telling the truth is the one whom Zedekiah is constantly seeking. He simply wants the truth to be something different than it is. My friends, we, we've got to hang here and learn some, learn some lessons, I believe. I just want to say this. This is a pet peeve of mine. Um, when uh, a person of spiritual maturity or uh, religious uh, responsibility, and, and I get those are different things and there's a long continuum. But when you come to say, uh, come to me and say, well, I've been praying about this. When it's an issue that involves all of us, Please don't assume that I haven't already been praying to. I'm going to try really hard. I don't think I do that um, much. Uh, but it really bothers me, this kind of assumption that, you're the, that prayer has not been a part of my tool belt so far. And that's exactly what they do to Jeremiah. The king sends somebody to talk to him. Will you... Will you pray to the Lord on our behalf? As if Jeremiah had not been doing that already. Another issue uh, that I have uh, is that we do a lot of 
of um, we mistreat other people a, a lot to avoid a truth that will mean we must change. Uh, hear me out. We just want the truth to be what we've already prepared for, not what is. How do you get prepared for a cell when the charges are manufactured like they were for Jeremiah? How do you prepare for a cistern? That's as if we could predict just how wicked or evil another person will be. Uh, what they can devise as a plan or how they can use or misuse their power. But here with Jeremiah, he stood firm in the face of cells, in the face of hunger, in the face of cisterns, in the face of potential disease, it wasn't just discomfort. Can you imagine the misery at the bottom of that cistern and wondering if anybody cares, especially the one who has called you into an obedience that led you to this moment? So what if, my friends, what if our willingness to be obedient to God gets us sideways? with others in our lives so that really unwarranted, undeserved, and brutal treatment comes to us. I'm thinking breach in relationships, judgment that may come from others. Now we can't control what other people do. What I'm asking about is how do we stay faithful to God and cling to God's promised love, mercy, and grace when there's a sister involved? I don't know about you, but one of my first prayers, my first line of defense, after God help me, <laughs> is to say, why? Is there, a, is there a lesson here? Did I do it wrong? I, no judgment in which is the most appropriate way to move through this. I want us to sit with this, my friends, that it's not just the Jeremiah's of the world. It's the you's and the me's. When we make a, a promise, a commitment to be obedient to God, we may be led through some difficult valleys. Not difficult because uh, something comes to us, but because in obedience we walk into it. How do we hang on to our courage and our commitment to this one who is allowing misery to touch us? I, I wish that there was a more romantic way to answer that question, but I think at least where I am right now, my answer is this. God is bigger than any and every cell. God is bigger than the wickedness that concocts the plan that would send you or me into that cistern. And we are not invisible to God when we are there. Oh, how I wish, oh, how I wish that there would be a promise spoken or written as the word of God. Yeah, there's not gonna be any more cisterns in your life. There's not gonna be any more of this or that that breaks your heart. <laughs> Because you have been obedient to God, but I've read the end of the book and the revelation, this glorious picture of what the turning of the age is going to be like, that in that new age, in the glory that we are promised, that's when tears disappear and misery ceases. 
But until then, you and I have got to figure out when it's our turn in the cistern or in the cell, how we hang on to our faith in God, even when those who call on God's name treat us so poorly. Now, I do want to caution us. Sometimes we're the ones who are threatened with the cistern. And let's be honest, sometimes we are the ones who would really like to throw all of our enemies and maybe a peep or two into the cistern. We've been on both sides of it, my friends. You know we have. It does not honor God. Just this pointing to a perfect life. See, I've not had to deal with any of that. I, I, I don't know if you're ready to pray with me or not, but I, I think I'm ready to pray that God would help me understand Jeremiah's ministry, what it was like to bear the burden that he did to speak words that were not welcome and words that would open the prison doors before they were slammed behind him. That would make others see to the point that they would rather Jeremiah disappear in the mud than hear the truth. Okay, another way to think about what we're learning from Jeremiah. Uh, am I willing to be faithful no matter what? The problem is we don't know what the what is that might be coming. And so instead of worrying about that, my friends, instead of thinking about the what ifs around cisterns and cells, maybe the greater way for us to know what it means to cling to the hope of God's promise is to know God's promise inside and out. And when you and I focus, I just had this uh, remembrance. I hope that this is all true the way I can recount it. Do you know how those who work at the U.S. Treasury, you know how they get uh, to be experts with regard to um, fake money, counterfeit money? It's not by spending time learning all the details about counterfeit money. They spend so much time with the real thing they know the real thing so well that when there is a counterfeit bill that comes across their path, they can know it in an instant. That'll preach. When you and I cling to and know the promises of God, when we know the word of God as if it has been a whisper into our ear in every move and every moment, that our lives are filled with. That's hope, my friends. It won't matter what the cistern looks like or when the cell might come because that hope will be even more real. I believe that's what enabled Jeremiah to keep going, even after being pulled out of that cistern. What's gonna keep you going, my friends, no matter what the next season might hold for you? do know this, that you are a child of the beloved. It is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead that will raise you, that will raise each of us. Hallelujah. What a Savior, what love for any and every moment of our lives. That Jeremiah was something. You are too. Let's pray together. Lord, I just pray that every person who hears the sound of my voice right now would trust you enough to turn your face, turn their face toward you, to open themselves wide, up, literally and figuratively, and feel the love pouring in, the affirmation, the encouragement, 
Would you enable them, Lord, to hear you call them your beloved? For that's who we are. We belong to you. You created us. You know us better than we know ourselves. And you love us deeper than we could ever imagine or know to ask for. And though we hit bumps along the road, whether they're simply, oh, obstacles we didn't see or cells that we have been assigned, you above all are the power and the wisdom, the courage and the strength that enables us to move forward. We belong to you. And so in the days of cells and cisterns for each one of us, would you also make your promised hope a greater reality? Would you bring to mind, oh God, in every moment that we need it, that reminder of your promise, the promises like you'll never leave us or forsake us, like you've given us gifts and abilities that not only are a blessing for each one of us, but you blessed us so that we would be a blessing to the world around us. Promises like there's nowhere we can go where you are not with us, that there's nothing we could do to make you disown us. Would you remind us, Lord, of who and whose we are, regardless of what our moments hold? that we might in our strength that comes from you, in our courage that comes from you, be who you are making us to be, regardless of the name anyone else would assign us. We are your beloved. Thank you. That's all we have, except for surrendering ourselves. The only words we have are thank you, God. May our lives be a constant thank you to you, for you, and about you as we live these moments you've given us. In the name of Jesus, we offer our gratitude. Amen. I, I double dog dare you, not just once, twice, but Maybe let's do this five times sometime today. When you pass a mirror, when you have to go to the restroom, when you pass one in your hall, whatever, would you stop just long enough to look at yourself? Stop with the, oh, my eyebrows are crooked or they're uneven or I got a double chin or that color doesn't really look that good on me. Look into your eyes, your own eyes. And would you tell yourself, I am a child of the King. I am God's beloved. Straighten your crown and let's live the way God has enabled us, including obedience even when there are cells and cisterns up ahead. Be strong, my friends, in his strength. And I'll see you soon. Bye.